for joining us today. Uh, my name is Nick Sargent, president of SIA. Today we have a great panel lined up to talk about the impact of inclusive content. We all have an obligation to create a more welcoming and inclusive winter outdoor community, but there's also a strong business imperative as well. The question is, how do we move forward holistically with authenticity and intentionality? Today's session will focus on the importance of a fully integrated approach to inclusion and the role that content plays, as well as the overall benefits inclusion creates for the community, the consumer, and your brand. So to introduce the town hall and the panelists, I wanna give a special thanks to our moderator, Stan Evans. I'm sure you all are familiar with Stan's photography. He's also creator of Social Studies Show and a member of the SA Board of Directors. So Stan, thank you so much for putting this together. I'm also pleased to welcome today's panelists, Virgil Abloh, Chief Executive Officer of Off-White, Jason Brown, VP Marketing Foot Locker, KFL and LFL, and Karen Kildow, Head of Social Beyond Meet Uninterrupted and Founder of Content Capital. The town hall will be a conversation between the panelists. We'll engage uh, and encourage you to submit questions during the Q&A. Uh, please use the tool at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to answer all the questions as quickly and as we can uh, due to the time permits of this session. So with that, I wanna get things moving and turn this over to Stan. Here you go, Stan. Hi, thanks everyone. And first of all, I wanna thank SIA for putting this panel on and thank the panelists for joining. When I thought about all the people in the world that I've wanted to talk to about this subject, you three are my top picks. So I'm extremely grateful that you all fit it into your schedule. The reason why you three are so important is because there's been enough talking about hypotheticals. You three are experts in your fields and have done inclusive projects from conceptualization to completion with amazing results. I feel right now, brands are in a state of analysis paralysis. Going over the same initiatives, repetitive talks, podcasts, and clubhouse chats, when actually what is needed are guidelines and action. So I figured let's bring in people at the top of their game and let them share their examples of success with inclusive content. There are two sides to this coin, ethical and financial freedom. Both are core values and have to be fulfilled to create lasting change. So I wanna share an important story for brands. In 2006, The Economist reviewed, interviewed Frederick Rosan, the managing director of Cristal on how its owners felt about seeing rappers drink the champagne in their videos. That's a good question, but what we, can we do, he replied. We can't forbid people from buying it. I'm sure Dom Perignon or Krug would be delighted to have their business. Jay-Z recounted how he felt to hear that. That was like a slap in the face. I released a statement saying that I would never drink Cristal or promote it in any way or serve it at my clubs ever again. Because of that, Jay-Z bought Ace of Spades Champagne, which he built up and then sold for 50% stake at Moet Hennessy for an estimated 600 million with an estimated cash payment to himself for 300 million. The moral of that story is one small slide of a culture can result in a missed opportunity for a multitude of communities to thrive. Cristal missed out on Jay-Z's creativity, resilience, and work ethic because they didn't recognize what they were seeing ethically or financially. So today we've got Virgil, Karin, and Jason here to help brands avoid these missteps and help usher in a brighter future for humanity. So, with that, I think we're going to start with Virgil because let's just get into it. I love your free game project. That is just amazing, just of how to help minorities start their own brand. So I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about that and, and if you could just kind of allude to what you're doing there. Yeah. No, thanks for having me. It's such a cool panel to, to sort of iterate on these ideas. Um, you know, it's like one of those big things, <laughs> you know, like how do you live a life um, how do you wake up and sort of understand how like systemic racism creeps into the crevices of humanity? Like it's everywhere. It's in the bloodstream. It's, it's overground. It's underground. It's what's said. It's what's unsaid. It's, it happens across gender, male and female and other. It happens across, um, you know, skin tones, racial, you know, religious background. So my philosophy you know, once I've sort of like gotten to an age to sort of understand the complexity, my personal solution is always literally to do 60 things at one time. 
<laughs> you know, like if you, if you just simply do the math, right? Like how do you, like how do you like we'll have this conversation amongst the four of us. We'll probably story arc it into a good place. Mm -hmm. Then as soon as we go to the grocery store, or as soon as you get onto your next Zoom, someone might be judging you based on the things that we've literally unpacked and mm -hmm. and repackaged. So for me. Um, one of my 60 efforts to sort of, and that's the only way I can rationalize it is I do, that sort of falls in the bucket of like, I'm gonna try to solve this in my own community. Mm -hmm. and, and the this is how do young black people become creatives in a space that's largely not diverse, you know, fashion, art, design. Mm -hmm. These things are categorically, um, you know, there's an archetype when you say those things. When you say a fashion designer, you can almost picture the the race, the gender, the the nationality, et cetera, et cetera. If you say fine artist, you know, people would think like Picasso or something like that. That's very far from me, a black 40 year old from Chicago, Rockford, Illinois. So free game is literally in a nutshell. It's like me skipping the long talk like I'm doing now and just in 10 bullet points tells the 17 year old version of myself how to do what I do or how to how to get to where I'm from and this is something you can't find in a textbook it's it's usually the trade secrets that people keep to themselves because it's like hey I made it like it was really hard like I'm not going to tell anyone like I don't want to have 30 other people competing for my job but I'm self-assured in my position i know the deficiency in education and information within the black community so it's literally like a for us by us mentality it's go to someone who has an esteemed position in 10 bullet points distill it mm -hmm. so that it becomes a database for young people no matter the ethnicity but it's like we're starting the conversation amongst ourselves so they can get the right like path set and they sort of know the secret and i call that free game okay so it's funny because in that space it's kind of why i created social studies because in the advertising and activism world there aren't a lot of places for black people or mentors because it's the whole hold it in kind of style and so that's part of the reason why i started that but the other thing where i think this kind of comes into and in, in kind of showing a little template and changing the game kind of perspective is um, something that Karen has been working on and she basically like reinvented the landscape for ski racing and establishing her sister as one of the most famous skiers in the world, you know, like surpassing Bodie Merrill and Tommy Moe and Alberta Tomba and Herman Zerbergen and Ingemar Stenmark. And I'd like to talk about how she kind of redid that through inclusive content, because I think that's a really, um, pivotal change in the way that when I grew up like ski racing was a male dominated thing and like they've totally shifted the game on that with with their social media content so Karen if you want to jump in yeah well I mean I think I'm personally like super passionate about social media because I think it gives people the platform to speak about the things that really matter to them and you know Lindsay's a winter Olympian it's not necessarily always the most mass appeal compared to like a NBA player or NFL player. And so what we tried to do is just use her platforms to tell her story and let people really understand who she was and her experience. So for me, it was just helping her to be able to, you know, not hold in that experience like you guys are talking about, but like share her ups and downs, share her insecurities, share her um, obstacles with health and injury and I think it really ended up bringing a lot of followers and attention because people were able to follow her arc of it's not always wins you're not always going to be the person on the top of the podium you also go through a lot to get there and recently you know as she's retired has been an interesting experience too because now that there's no more ski racing how does her brand evolve and I think it really is steeped in like sharing authentic stories and helping give people some someone to look up to and be like this person is the same as me like Lindsay works out eight hours a day in the gym and is the most successful skier in history but she also gets hurt when people body shame her and talk about her cellulite and it's like 
think of all the young girls out there who are like, wow, if Lindsay can talk about this, what does that mean to me? And how does that help me to be able to navigate my life? So I think um, in general, like working with athletes on social has been really interesting because they have the opportunity without any parameters of press and brands to be able to say exactly what they wanna say. And um, for all the brands out there, I think my biggest takeaway is A, have an inclusive and diverse group of people that you're working with. So make sure you're working with people that represent the world at large. So there's females, there's people of color, there's different orientations, religions, all those things so that you're, you're representing the world at large and your consumers and then ask them actual questions about what they care about. I think a lot of brands you end up just being like, oh, how, how'd you play today? Like, how does it feel to be a successful athlete? And really you should be asking them, what do they care about in the world? Like, what do they want to see changed? What I like about it is it, it gives a window to her character. Mm -hmm. and when you go into the character, you understand why people are buying things or sharing things or what they're going through and it makes them attainable. And attainability makes you want to actually go about supporting the things that she supports, supporting the brands that she supports because she obviously feels about them and, and is, is using them because of how they make her feel about her character. So I think that's super important. Mm -hmm. um, so I think maybe um, Jason, if you wanna like get in the mix here a little bit about that, I think um, when you're talking about character and windows to um, inclusive things, you were talking about your nephews and getting them into snowboarding some of your past and how that became a window to your soul and your career. So we can maybe chat a little bit about that. Absolutely. Um, well, first off, thank you, SIA. Thank you, Stan, for inviting me. Glad to be here with Virgil and Karin. Really appreciate it. Um, and to your point, yeah, if it wasn't for the outdoors, I probably would not be here right now working for Foot Locker. And I'd have to take it back to when my parents first took me skiing for the first time. We only went once but it was the first time going to Mammoth, being out there in the snow, but it opened my eyes to something that I wasn't aware of. And even though we never went back as a kid, I had always just gravitated towards snowboarding, skiing, and then action sports became big. And then ironically, I got a job at Fuel TV, right? The first 24 seven action sports network celebrating all of the various sports. And then that led to subsequent jobs with NBC Sports and Red Bull. And then, as I told you, one of my most memorable times uh, was going to Bald Face Mountain, getting in a helicopter and realizing that I'm actually at work. And throughout that journey, I was also able to bring my nieces and nephews to X Games and meet Brian Sheckler or Keir Dillon and all those other guys. And it's, it's easy to think that you can be an athlete but I've found a career which wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for my exposure to the outdoors, to action sports, and through all those relationships and, and brands uh, that I've worked with has ultimately put me on the path to where I am right now. So there's multiple ways and you can look at the benefit of diversity. It's not even just from a consumer perspective, but how you can also just change the landscape of your business. For sure. And let's talk about that for a second because Virgil, with your fashion show, Louis Vuitton, your opening scene of just like that winter's landscape and that black man crunching through the woods, kind of like walking through and just seeing the sounds and the shapes and stuff like that. In my mind's eye, like that's how I've imagined black explorers for like a long time like that and like how I've always wanted to see it and show it and like for you to actually go do it. It was just like for me, it like it like really just brought home, like it took my breath away because like as 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 a black man who's been trying to create that, like you went and did it, and I was just like, oh wow. And so like kids see that, right? And so for me, it's so pivotal because I literally was just on a shoot for backcountry like last week. And I'm out there in the mountains and I'm standing in this peak, like literally 35 miles away from everything, snowmobiling, and I'm with Russell Winfield, and I got to shoot that photo that's been in my head for years with Russell and we're having this moment in the outdoors and like how we created this world. And I think that's the thing where people don't understand for black people, there's different channels, right? It's not always like the great white hunter in the, the, the wilderness like that. It's like, we wanna see ourselves too out there yeah. doing these things, right? And for me and what it touched on and what you've kind of done and what I'm curious about 
is looking at how you kind of extrapolated a view of almost like Beyonce's Black is King. And so all of a sudden we're telling the outdoors from the narratives of black people in the outdoors and showing these visuals and things that appeal to us. And so when you show those things that appeal to us and on our channel, then that's where we like get invested and where we want to actually become part of that world, become part of those things and buy those products. So I, I'd love to hear a little bit about a little bit about your thought process of creating that show. So many, and it's so good to be in this space because, like, imagine when I'm doing like a fashion interview and I talk about like an a, a, an old uh, alphanumeric shoot, mm -hmm. and the the fashion crit writer has no idea what I'm talking about. Yeah. You know, one of the first black owned snowboard skate culture brands that, for me, is the pinnacle of 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 brands, you know, I put that above Ralph Lauren or something like that. For but sure. it's so it's so interwoven, and that's the beauty of fashion. Um, you know, I don't really prescribe to any industry, as you can probably tell. Like, if you follow my Instagram, I'll be DJing in Miami next week or something, and then snowboarding with Russell, like Heli in whatever Utah, the a couple of weeks back. I've got a but, name for that right now. <laughs> like, remember Living Color? Yeah. <laughs> So remember Jay making airlines? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, the pilots land in the plane and he's out on the car and he's doing the drinks. Like, I like it. That's my new nickname for myself. I'm the Jamaican Airlines. One minute I'm riding motorcycles, I'm snowmobiling, and I'm snowboarding. Yeah, like, you know, like that's stuff. us in our natural state. You know, just as far as we're talking about, like these boxes that people get put in, yeah, we well, end up having to spend the rest of our career like breaking down the box so people don't judge us by being a human being but it for me what's unique about this space I can tell the origin story of myself you know I'm a kid who grew up Rockford Illinois you know I've learned how to snowboard on golf courses you know mm -hmm. Tyrell Basin was like my home mountain you know they had a pipe dragon mm -hmm. we were you know that was our whole teenage experience skateboarding snowboarding listening mm -hmm. to rap and rock and like grunge music mm -hmm. of course i don't look like you know people judge a book by its cover that's the context sure. of the whole conversation so mm -hmm. no matter what space i go in whether i'm getting a lift ticket i get on the gondola at jackson hole and people are probably like yo you should be going to the the bunny hill yeah <laughs> it's like i've been snowboarding since you know i could ride a bike or something like that mm -hmm. but now i'm a I, I design fashion right and so because I don't look like the archetype, <laughs> there's so many instances for misunderstanding or, or like confusion. You mm -hmm. can just go look in my Instagram comments. Like if I post like a skateboard, mm -hmm. people automatically assume that I can't skateboard and I have no idea and I just love the culture of it or whatever. Mm -hmm. Or even better yet, like I'll wear an arc. This is my best sort of like uh, visual prism to understand like the complexities that I was talking about before. Like I wear Arcteryx, right? It's it's a brand that's like outdoor, but it has this cult culture to it that is almost like, hey, you're not supposed to wear that unless you know about that. You know, I've been wearing outdoor brands for whatever. So 2019, I'll be like posting myself or whatever. People in the comments are like, oh, the brand is dead. You know, like you're just vulturing whatever it is. And it's like, you know, then I've used Arcteryx and work, I put him in a women's show mm -hmm. that uh, was just developed as this idea of couture, you know, take is like women's couture mm -hmm. wearing outdoor brands seen on all races. Like that was my vision a little bit forward. Mm -hmm. And then people are like, oh, you're ruining the brand like even more, <laughs> you know, et cetera, et cetera. But to me, of course, like if you go back to my origin story, like I'm, our sports are driven by progression, right? Like someone does a trick, I'll get back to your point, <laughs> but basically like visualization, like before there was YouTube and before there was like seeing someone do a tray flip over eight stairs, a kid in uh, New York and Berlin can do that in three hours after they see it mm -hmm. visually, right? That's how our sports progress. Like someone sees someone do a trick, someone's like, oh, it's possible. So you know, for me, it was about doing, like, I just love that journey of watching and understanding the underlying sort of like racism layer of like, hey, you can't even wear outdoor apparel. <laughs> like, you must not know what it is. 
you you this is for us like you're so far removed and then 2020 happens and then everyone's like oh hey you know we're 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 with you we're standing with you but like the the point of this zoom is like within our industry of outdoor sports especially action sports mm -hmm. like it's almost harbors like systemic racism and objectifying male or female or or reducing human beings because it's like these sports aren't for you no matter what okay. and let alone the culture okay. is it, you okay. must not understand it not. so like fashion okay let's go back to your main point when i get on my louis vuitton like i go to louis vuitton it's a it's an amazing megaphone and platform for me yeah. to yell <laughs> but <laughs> to do it with poi you know my my character isn't even that aggressive right yeah. i just like to think mm -hmm. and i like to create like it's the best space for someone like me so i bring it all to the table i put saul williams you know in the alps mm -hmm. and if you listen to what he's saying as well it's like it's literally articulating the, oh. the black experience and and to me that's one of the 60 ways to just like be nuanced to not have to speak about it, you know, it's my work, and then directly go heli in Utah and enjoy, you know, hanging out with a crew that can get all the nuance and you don't have to have the long conversation. For sure. And so here's something I kind of want to go and extrapolate on that with, 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 with Jason. So like, let's look at the beginnings of that, right? Because you're just, we're pointing out some of the stuff that you're doing with Foot Locker with the geo strategy and the lead program, as far as like getting people involved at a community level and starting that with um, power stores in the community, like, you know, and you're talking about how you're, instead of going to your old haunts of Hollywood or 34th Street in New York, you're actually going to Compton to go create community and engagement and give people um, a space and um, a commerce in their community and employing people. So Jason, if you can tell us a little bit about what you're doing with Foot Locker. No, absolutely. And uh, just real quick on the point Virgil made, shout out, because Saul Williams is the Michael Jordan of spoken word. And to be able to see Saul on that platform, and I know his iTunes sales probably went through the roof, his book sales, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I think that is a perfect manifestation of, uh, of diversity. Exactly. So. And I'm going to ping pong. We're going to make this a round table. No, I do no stiff zooms. You know, this is a vibe. <laughs> Bet, so dude. just to ping pong off. I know one of the things you said, and this is SIA. You, part of this conversation is business. Okay. Right? Yeah. Like, let's not get it twisted. Like we are going to like make the world a happy place, but this is business focused, right? Yeah. And what you just said, Jason, is like for the business minded, who's a little bit like, I don't, I, I get that we want to be responsible, but I have a p &L And, you know, if this business is out of business, trying to be responsible, then I don't have a job, you know, whatever. Absolutely. And the moral of the story is this equals more profits, right? Across the board. It, it like, and it's like, like you said, Saul Williams, that's a deep cut. Like, he is a, an icon artist. And when we're going to cast models for covers or for, for front row of the fashion show or in the show, it's not only who has Instagram followers, it's not only who's popular of the, you know, it's not just, there's not just one black snowboarder. Or there's not just one Lindsay. There's not just, either, you gotta support the community. The system. And then, yeah, but not to cut you up, but that's like a key bullet point. Right. So I'm going to ping pong back because you're Ooh. absolutely right. And I'm going to build off of something that Karen alluded to earlier. And the way that I interpreted it was that she was referring to having a conversation with your audience, you know, doing that research. But what I think is just as or more important is that at your brand, making sure that you have your, you have just of a diverse internal staff as you do with the people that you're trying to have a conversation with because yes. what that ends up giving you is a level of cultural fluency 
where you're not just going out to Virgil's point and looking for who has the most followers. If you have a level of cultural fluency, you're gonna know who the right people are that are gonna be authentic and credible to that audience that you're trying to have the conversation with. And that's, you know, that also dovetails into what makes business sense because that campaign is gonna work at the end of the day. Gotcha. Yeah, and I would also say that it's like, the pitfall is saying, okay, I want to like get all these cool people that are culturally relevant and like put them in my ad and like use their face to sell my products. Cause that will get delivered to the bottom line. And I just think that the biggest thing is Gen Z, like specifically Gen Z, like they really care so much that your brand stands for something and has a mission. So if you have the diversity without the inclusion is like how you're bringing that to life. So like, what are you doing with those people? How are you fueling their community or changing their lives or creating systems that's gonna make things better? So it's like, the first step is yes, bring diverse voices in. Then it's like, how are you going to help those voices and empower them to change the world? And that's what I think that second step doesn't always happen. Yeah, so it's- technology to the to the to the brands. Like, it's just like, what's your mode of operation? Like, where are you going with this? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and I think uninterrupted and working people, on it. All yeah. your, and throw them on a, a billboard, I think of that. But what does your brand stand for? Are you going and touching with these things with the communities? Are you talking to these different types of diverse um, audiences and really actually trying to help them? Because mm -hmm. if you help them, then they will help your brand. But if you're just going out and just doing some high level virtue signaling, it's not going to work and people are going to see through it. Yeah, they, uh, they will definitely see through it. So it's like, yeah. No, I would definitely agree. And I just echoing what Karin said in the sense of having purpose, it's, it's a brand business imperative nowadays. If you want to talk to Gen Z, you must have that. Granted, you could stand for different things, but as polarizing as the world is, you have to also accept the fact that you're going to piss off someone. It's just inevitably going to happen. But if you have values and principles, most likely there's a broad community that adopts to those as well. But I think when you take into consideration, look at what Patagonia just did. Outdoor brand, they say, hey, you know what? We feel this way about the voting legislation that's going on in Georgia. We're gonna, we're gonna support that. That's, that's, our, that's our mission, that's our position. And granted, they might lose some consumers here, but they might gain double in the state of Georgia. And, but having that, clear vision and focus in terms of what you stand for and your consumers knowing what you stand for is the essence of diversity and progression. Yeah, yeah, and, it, and I think working on a lot of brands, like it, it is hard sometimes because there's all these parameters and rules and all these things. And my kind of not cheat code, but like, I think it's a smarter way to go about it is talk to the ambassadors you have and say, what do you want to do? And then let your brand dollars fuel that change. And I think it helps because the voice is authentic, the story is authentic, and your money is going to make, like solve a problem that they are experiencing versus you trying to have your own perspective on what, what you think that this community wants. And I think Uninterrupted did a does a really great job of that. Like more than a vote, it was like, hey, here's all these athletes and we care about this election and we're gonna tell all of our stories about how these vote, black voter suppression impacts us in different ways. And every single story is authentic because it's a real authentic story and you're not orchestrating anything. You're just being like, it's kind of like fueling and being the megaphone for the, the real stories. And I think that's where it just helps brands be able to do positive things without getting into the weeds of like, can we do this? Can we say this? Because if someone's actually having that experience, then it's authentic. Well, I call that the gatekeeping versus the facilitating syndrome. And the so one thing- Gatekeepers are more facilitators. And similar, so it's building on what Karin just said as well as Uninterrupted is not a huge company, right? But in the same token, they knew what they stood for with more than a vote. And when you stand for something like that, what it also does is creates a domino effect. And when you think about how their influence was able to work with the various leagues, whether that be the basketball teams and the baseball and football teams in terms of leveraging their arenas and stadiums, getting people registered to vote. 
I mean, it seems like such a simple thing, like why didn't we do that before? But I really feel like that more than a vote initiative was the catalyst and that was the domino effect and result of that work. You never know where it's gonna end up. So something for me, because I wanna talk about a little dollars and cents here, right? So you're talking about for the Foot Locker Lead Program, investing 200 million over five years to support communities, black workforce and communities. So I wanna ask you, where do you see the benefits for that and how do you see that money coming back and what is the driving force for Foot Locker to invest that kind of money into these communities? So, you know, our, our corporate mission at Foot Locker is to inspire and empower youth culture. And that's really broad territory, it gives us the opportunity to do a lot of different things. And we definitely, have done a, a solid job in the past in terms of how we decide to give back on a national level and a local level. And in all honesty, you know, when everything took place last summer with George Floyd, we also had a conversation internally in terms of assessing if we could or needed to do more. And the answer was yes. And it, it took a while for us to figure out exactly how we could do it in a meaningful way because we didn't want to cut a check and say, hey, we donated money here, but how could we focus on very specific pillars that we know would not only impact our consumers in a positive way, but also impact the employees at our organization. We obviously have our headquarters, but then we have thousands of employees that are out in the field on just across the board that suffer the same sort of systemic racism that we're all having a conversation about. And we wanted to figure out a way how we can impact as many people as possible. And the result was a commitment of $200 million over the course of five years. And it's done through two specific pillars, one being economic empowerment, and then the other being education. So on the education side, we're, we're giving over a quarter million dollars to scholarships for our team members. We also created a bridge program so that our store associates can have the opportunity to get experience at HQ. A lot of those people there just have never previously had the opportunity. So opening that door for them to get that experience. Um, from an economic empowerment standpoint, looking at the various vendors that we're using. So as you can imagine, Foot Locker, we're pumping out content on a regular basis, whether that's video content, commercials, photo shoots, things of that nature, nature. And then we also have a host of agencies that we use on a regular basis. And then lastly, when you take into consideration, you know, we obviously carry Nike, Adi, Timberland, the really big brands, but also having more of a purposeful focus in terms of bringing those black owned brands into the Foot Locker ecosystem. And, you know, one of the things that I'm very proud about, because I think Foot Locker is, is different to a certain degree because sneaker culture, you know, which is our DNA is pretty much founded by black culture and influenced the most by black culture. So we even had even more of a responsibility to make sure that we were living up to the expectations that a brand has when you're capitalizing on something like culture. And the lead program is how we do it. So this is, um, we're almost a year in, but very proud of the progress that we've made and definitely feel as though it proves to our consumers that we are about our word as it relates to our commitments, but then also the sense of loyalty and the qualitative feedback that we've got has just been astronomical across the board. Awesome. Um, so with that, I actually kind of want to lead into Virgil a program that you're working on with I Support Black Women with Trinise McNally, and then talking about how you guys developed a campaign, and then your act active effects of fundraising to build a physical school for Black feminist politics. Yeah, and that's an initiative that I'm doing through Off-White as a platform, you know, so in a way... Off-White was my resume to be able to, to do Louis Vuitton and, or to do Nike, or to do whatever I do. Um, and for me, you know, I always grew up with this like huge uh, admiration for this brand called United Colors of Benetton. Mm -hmm. You know, like I think it, in speaking of a business context, it dispelled this myth, you know, in the Patagonia of the current time to dispel this myth that to be a brand you have to sort of be in the middle like mm -hmm. you you don't have to sort of proclaim any opinion or pick a side and I think that 
current generation um, as the context is like, no one can be in the middle. Like, you know, if there's injustices to humanity, they need to be fought for if, if you're human or something like that. And so Off-White being my platform and knowing that I, I strongly believe in what United Colors of Bemtown by sort of expressing their opinion through brand. Within Off-White, I uh, got in touch with Trinice McNally. She is, you know, very, you know, she's like a modern voice, you know, that's fighting for Black people's rights and, and uh, within her community. And I was like, I wanted to see a fashion brand sort of make a platform so that her megaphone can go louder in a stylish way, in a modern way, yeah. like in a yeah. 2021, mm -hmm. like we can put down the fashion images for a second yeah. and, and show and have other people lead. And it, it's a tandem thing. I think the other thing that's also important to note I'm not an expert in mm -hmm. everything, right? And just because I'm known for doing one thing doesn't make me a spokesperson, doesn't make me qualified to speak for a whole community of people. And I think that's something to tell ourselves, but also to tell the public. Yeah, it's so only through community can you get the best. Like Trinice is a way better verbalizer of of, of things that I feel and things that I want to change. So us together, my platform and her. And so that's what the I Support Black Women campaign is about. You know, oppression was real, slavery happened. You know, these things are, we're still overcoming them. Those are just two generations, just like any other human sort of wrongs that have happened throughout history. You know, these things are recent, <laughs> you know. Yeah, you know. Happen. <laughs> it's still happening and so it's like you know what I mean you know like my my ancestors are from Ghana and West Africa the po photo that I posted yesterday was me at the door of no return you know which is like those aren't books they're not like fairy they're not stories this actually happened so the way I see it is that I use my brand to to highlight and give platform and, and I think that makes me sleep at night knowing that it's not just fashion or trends that that I'm developing and putting out in the world or making space for younger designers to come through. We're actually making space and in, in sort of giving platform. Well, it's humanity. And on that touch, as far as that, I'd like, I'd like to talk to Karen a little bit about like her using and her and Lindsay doing the body positive um, initiative that they had kind of come across and just how it kind of helps extrapolate and talk a little bit about um, just bringing comfortable in your own skin and, and telling those stories. Yeah, I mean, I think I touched on it before, but it's, it's just using your own experience like we're talking about to share that in a wider way. So Lindsay, yeah, and, and this is the kind of thing like sometimes you don't hear about this until you actually talk to somebody, but Lindsay, posted pictures from a vacation in a swimsuit. And she was like, you know, it's crazy all, all these comments about like how ruthless people are and like I'm supposed to be a, a athlete and it's crazy that it really impacts me. So I couldn't imagine being a teenage girl experiencing this. So we were able to craft a message about like, hey, this is me not looking great. This is me at my worst angles and these, body shaming comments really do impact me. Um, the post ended up getting 20 million impressions. It was on Good Morning America Today Show. Uh, I think she got like 500% growth on her social channels and it- 530. 530% growth. And it was actually um, more her most successful post of all time, even mm -hmm. over winning the Olympics. So um, it just showed that like, if you, talk about something that people really care about and be, show your vulnerability and your side of it. Like it, it just made so many waves. And that's why I love social because I feel like you're able to tell those stories and like really make an impact and re really quickly. And that's a good example. Like if any brand were to have helped fuel that story, like any brand 20 million impressions on a campaign would be really successful, let alone on one post. So, um, and we did that same thing with, you know, DeAndre Hopkins, who is another athlete I work with, he, um, just talking to him, he went to Clemson, he grew up in Clemson, South Carolina, went to Clemson University, and he's like, do you know that the whole Clemson College is 
built on plantation slave land. And all the buildings are named after like prolific slave owners. And it always bothered me. And it like, it's hard to go to this school because of this. And he's like, we should change the name. So we were, I was like, okay, we talked to the school. They're like, we've been trying to do this. All we need is like national sustained press. He's like, boom, posted something. And literally in one day there was 50,000 signatures on a petition. And three days later, the, the college names were changed. And that again, it's like an example of if any brand got 50,000 people to do anything, like that would be a huge success. And that would be, that's like such a powerful example of listen to somebody, hear their story, and then create a process to change that system. And so I think I, that's why I love like, I love social because you can do something like that that has real impact that really cha like changes people's perceptions. Like the people at Clemson University, the whole football team was behind it. Like they didn't even really think about it or maybe they didn't know all the history and, and it was all able to change in three days something that's been around for 50 years or hundred years. And um, that's all just one, one social post. So I would encourage brands to think outside of like a classic campaign of like, here's our ad spot, here's our pictures and out of home. It's like those kind of campaigns that are cause based and like story based can, can really make a huge impact and get the massive press that you, that you all, everyone's always wanting. And Noah, just I have to add on to Karen again, and this is similar to the more than a vote um, scenario she was referring to before, but after DeAndre did that, it was the same domino effect that I was referring to earlier happened again. So then you also see the young high school athletes that look up to professional athletes that started doing the same thing with their high schools that found out, hey, they found out the history of why their school was named what it was, and they also didn't feel comfortable. So you just really will never know the impact that you can make when you stand for something and do the right thing. And that is a prime example. So looking at that, Jason, can you, I want to talk to you a little bit about getting specific and into the communities and talking a little bit about your geo strategy. And so just as far as looking at a specific product and marketing experiences tailored towards specific communities. So mm -hmm. we can kind of talk about the, <clears throat> the beneficial effects of inclusive marketing. So if you can talk a little touch on that. Absolutely. So I'll start from, from a macro level because to, to Virgil's point earlier, it's, it's, there's definitely a business case. And then there's also just the, the personal humanity case of it as well. And to your point, you know, we have beautiful flagship stores in Times Square, Hollywood and Highland, all those typical places you would think that we would exist. But at the end of the day, we are a publicly traded company and, you know, we need to increase revenue year over year. And that means we also need to go to new places and fulfill the needs of consumers. And we also wanted to do it in a very strategic way so that it was actually a meaningful experience and we didn't just put up a store. So back to my point earlier in terms of, you can't just say you're gonna do diversity without resourcing yourselves properly. And what we did was we created a framework where we're able to have different regions of the country that almost mirror what we do at our headquarters. So we have product, we have marketing, we have operations, and we're able to do these things on a very hyper-local hyper level. So the one example that I use is the store that we just opened in Compton, California, which is West Coast, my hometown. And if you went to the intersection where this store is, there's, there's really not a lot in that area at all whatsoever. And the Foot Locker that we opened there is probably one of the most beautiful stores that we opened. And in addition to that, we made sure that we built ties within the community, even working with the mayor's office. 85, 95% of the people that work there are from that area. We have you know, exclusive product that we're giving just to that specific location. Previously, they would have had to drive maybe 30 minutes to go to a different mall, but that community wants their own place where they can shop and have a great experience. So when you think about a footwear brand, like we are a retailer, you wouldn't necessarily think that we'd be having community events where we have a fresh produce farmer's market. That area is actually a food desert, if you know what a food desert is. Give, having back to school backpack drives, 
the activation space that we have within the context of the store is not only just for events and Q and A's and things of that nature, but so the local kids can come and just hang out there as well. And the thing is, at the end of the day, not only is that store thriving financially, it's also created a halo effect for the Foot Locker brand in the Southern California region. And that's why we're replicating that. So we did it in Washington Heights, which is uptown New York. Uh, we have the same thing in Detroit and right where Eight Mile is, we bought an old CVS, converted that into one, doing the same thing in Philly, Texas. So it's something that is not only great for us to build ties within the community, but it's also proven great for our business as well. And so I think that's something that I want to touch on with the outdoor community and kind of like traditionally how they see the channel of trying to fix minorities in the outdoor space. Everyone's solution usually is like, okay, let's go get a group of minorities. Let's take them to the mountain for a day, show them this experience, then take them back to their home. And that, and so it's just like, it's the whole like, give a man a fish for the day or teach a man a fish. And, and realistically, outdoor sports are extremely expensive, right? And then also looking at it, it's a different world. It's like if you're, for, for me, growing up, being a Black person getting in the snow, it was extremely uncomfortable trying to navigate that space being the only one, right? So all of a sudden, you're just like going, you're going to pluck, pluck me out of here and then put me over here and like have me just figure it out. Like, it's hard. So what I like about the way that Foot Locker's approach is that they're actually going into the community. They're talking to the people, they're gaining their trust, they're understanding the culture and then becoming some of the culture. And what I like about that is where it goes into larger spaces is then you actually, once you gain a community's trust, then you can show them what's available. And that's mm -hmm. when it talks when it talks about like Karen or Virgil or your life or my life. It's like, we saw the possibilities once people came into our culture and gave us a step and opportunity. And so we like, we went out to Jackson Hole or we went to Utah or we went to Bald Face. But it started with that small first step in our community and learning and having people that helped us there and us trusting those people. So all of a sudden, if you're like plucked in these people, you don't know who to trust. And so I think the whole thing is really looking at outdoor brands and instead of trying to be like, oh, we're just going to do this thing at this mountain over here. And like, people are going to trust us. Like, I mean, like, I mean, I don't know about you, but like, I don't trust anyone just off the bat, you know? So literally like, it's like, if you come into my community and like you share a meal and you like, you see where I'm from, you see the struggles that I'm doing, then you're kind of, you, you, you gain empathy, you know, and you have curiosity about things. And so with that, I realized that you're really trying to help and you're really trying to help my community. And then I see the possibilities of what I can do and where I can go and where we've all gone in our lives, right? And now we're actually be able to be able to like come full circle and help our communities and our people in these different spaces. And so that's the formula I'd like to see more with outdoor brands rather than just like, let's take you someplace and like drop you off here. And like, <laughs> here's the thing that like you may or may not ever get to, but here, come to my community and tell me why you think this thing is like important and impactful in my life. And then be like, hey, Virgil's doing this. It's had a great impact on his life. Jason's doing this. It's had a great impact on his life. Karin's doing this. It's had a great impact on life. Stan did this. Here's where his life has gone. And so when you see those examples, like we're all in this panel, inclusive marketing, right? We're all success stories in a certain sense. So that's where you actually have to have these people tell these stories in these communities and then bring them out to this other world and, and help them explore it. Oh, 100%. I, I think I completely agree. And I think one of the things that I definitely wouldn't want to get lost is the fact that diversity and inclusion doesn't have a finish line. It's a continuous journey. It's a perpetual conversation with that community that you are trying to build that relationship and trust with. Because if you think about where we are in 2020 compared to 2010, 2030, the world and the country is going to be even more diverse and you'll never get to that finish line. And it's about the commitment and dedication to have that perpetual conversation on a regular basis. Because to your point, if you just do this one thing, it's not going to be respected, nor are they going to believe you. So completely agree with that. Yeah. And so the other funny thing is by 2044, groups formerly known as minorities will reach majority status. So things are changing. Like it's like so it's like one of those things like if you want your business to survive 
you need to be able to go and talk and address and be able to implement yourself within these communities if you want to survive and thrive. Absolutely. Absolutely. It makes business sense. And, you know, 2020 also showed a lot of businesses and brands that are no longer in existence. And, you know, it was for some of them, it was inevitable. But a lot of the ones that are succeeding now and the ones that are thriving are the ones that have adopted exactly what you just said. And to make it to 2030, it's inevitable that it's a part of your business strategy. Otherwise, you're not going to succeed. So I think that um, as we're kind of coming to a close, I have a couple questions for you guys. Um, each of you, what advice would you give to your younger self? Karen, let Karen, Karen start. She's like, she's like, uh, contemplating over there. <laughs> I mean, I think it's really trusting in yourself. Like, I think as I get older, I realize no one really knows. Everyone's just kind of trying to figure it out mm -hmm. in the best way possible. So it's like trusting in your opinion, trusting in your voice and your perspective, because it does have value. Even if you're young, it has value. If you're, you know, it like have any certain specific expertise, like it really does matter. And I also would say, just raise your hand. Like, I feel like my career has been just asking for things saying, yes, I'll do it. I'll try it. Like, can I be in that meeting? Can I do that thing? And so I think that would be my advice to just keep doing that because you never know the opportunities that come with just asking if it's okay or like asking, could I do it? And saying yes and figuring it out later. Okay. How about you, Jason? Um, if I were to distill it, uh, I'd probably say I've, I've been an old man ever since I was a little kid. So black Benjamin button. Yeah, maybe that's what it is. Um, but I've also I was also very blessed to have a lot of opportunity at a young age. You know, I got a chance to work at Def Jam Records when I was 16 years old. So I was lucky enough to realize how to merge my passion points with business and opportunity. But I think the advice I probably give myself is to not be so hard on yourself. Mm -hmm. Don't stress out because I, I definitely did that to myself. Mm -hmm. And I would also, similar to what Karen was referring to, is trust myself to take more risks than I did and be comfortable with wherever you net out after that. Okay. All right. How about you, Virgil? For me, you know, informed by those good answers, it's like the same energy. You know, like the thing that I would tell the younger version of myself is that and I just made this up on the spot, <laughs> like the struggle is the point, right? Like yeah. no one, like what happens is when you're young and you meet like the first roadblock, you, you automatically are wish like, man, if that didn't have, if people didn't think of me like that, then I could do this. And you get fixated on the struggle for forever. Like, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here carrying on stuff that a professor like I had a professor tell me that I wasn't going to be an architect. And I was like, what do you mean by like my, a master's degree? I'm like I'm paying you to get a degree. And you're telling me that when I finish, I won't become what I'm here to do. Like that puzzled me. And I, you know, like I get up today in opposition to something someone said to me one time, you know, 30 years yeah, ago. Michael, you know, Michael Jordan. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Like, Say hi to the guy when you're leaving the restaurant because stuff and I think if you look at it in inverse instead of being like angry or motivated or feel like I have to disprove that really? like that struggle that's the point like if you don't have and often we look at the other side and we're and of course we're here trying to rid the world of that mm -hmm. but that is like the most valuable um it's literally the most valuable constant motivator you could ever have is disproving something or some context. And so it, it helps you understand life isn't a pain in the ass and like you're, you're running into walls all the time. Once you realize that that is the point of life, <laughs> like that's the, the, the greatest stories ever told, the hero's journey from Star Wars to the Bible, like it, it works in an arc. It doesn't work in a straight line. And if I had known that 
when I was younger, I might have been, you know, who am I kidding? I'd be in the same spot that I am now. <laughs> Oh my God. That's great advice. That's funny. It's all about the journey. For sure. Um, so I think kind of like for that, and I'm trying to think of what else I had for you guys. Um, um, how, would, how would you say future generations can follow a path to be like you, to be a Jason, to be a Karin, to be a Virgil, because you guys have all worked with great celebrities and superstars, but obviously, not everyone's going to be LeBron or Lindsay or Kanye. So I think like, like, how do you figure, like, how do you become your guys' jobs, architects of culture and creativity and help embrace that? I mean, I think my biggest thing is, is being really nice to everyone because it's insane how many people come back into your life in different ways. So <laughs> like be good with people and treat people well. And then I, my big thing I've been thinking about recently is just the ability to connect the dots. Like there's so much computing power and so many different like specific people. But I think it's like the people that succeed are like, this is happening here. I'm hearing this person talk about this. How do these things come together? How do we merge them? How do they not come together? So it's like being curious when you're talking to people and like learning things that you didn't really need to know and then trying to figure out what are the trends what are the connections between the types of things people are saying and that for me that got me really far because I was able to reference a lot of different conversations and see trends of like hey this is a way we could look at media different if we look at it through through social versus through tv and that's kind of always been my guide is just talking to people and trying to connect the dots that you're hearing awesome what about you, um, I don't know. Like, again, it sort of dovetails off of how Karin was vibing on it and, like, my my previous sort of, um, sort of monologue or whatever. It's, like, the uh, another thing is, like, especially when you, like, name those people, mm -hmm. like, you know, like icons of a generation, you know, we're all lucky to be able to work with people that are extremely talented and that comes across like uh, every so often. But, you know, I would, I would focus on not really fixating. I think the future world isn't going to be so unicorn driven, mm -hmm. right? Like that's look at social media, like uh, all those archetypes are from a different generation. Mm -hmm it's from a different era of when there was no social media, you know, that means the whole audience was lower now and someone has more followers, more influence. And you could say that it doesn't matter because it's real or not, but there's a metric to, to say that, that it's arguably different, you know? Mm -hmm. So I would, I always focus on self-esteem. It's like turbulent out there with, the digital versions of ourselves and the 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 actual accolades like you know are you winning gold medals are you losing and qualifying what happens to a college star athlete after the season ends and you're no longer the big person on campus or you age <laughs> you know like just try going hellying when now versus 17 it's a different it's a whole different mechanics on something you've been doing. I think as we become more human, you literally just have to become more human, you know, and, and not, and so, yeah, it's kind of like a ramble, but you get the vibe. I, I'm just going to keep on using it's turbulent out there because that was the best. <laughs> <laughs> as, soon as, as soon as you get off the zoo. Turbulent out there. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. Um, how about you, Jason? Um, well, first I'd say before I forget, Stan, you're going to be responsible for making sure this group gets on a heli trip, whether it be next winter or the winter yeah. after that, you're responsible for organizing the heli trip. Exactly. Um, I would, I would distill it into maybe three things and I'm not going to lie. Sometimes I do get jealous of the current generation in terms of them probably not realizing the amount of information that they have access to and finding their passion and purpose, using that information 
to become an expert in that field. Almost anyone can become an expert. I think the second thing I'd say is building and expanding your network and not just necessarily meeting people, but trying to also provide value, making it mutually beneficial. And then the last thing I'd say, similar to what Karin and what Virgil was mentioning is just being resilient. And I think if you do all those three things, I think anyone will probably be happy with where they net out. Awesome. Um, I think kind of one thing that I wanted to kind of conclude with, um, with especially with this group, and something I heard just recently and, and I really thought about and, and I think it really resonated with me is in doing inclusive content and trying to become a more inclusive community and, and diversity and, and equality and, and equity is having the courage to understand what we already know. You know, like we already know, like it's like it's, it's like it's a shifting of power. It's a sharing of power. It's a sharing of wealth. It's a sharing of financial like all these people and all these companies know this, right? They all know this now, right? And so it's just having the courage to understand what we already know, you know, and just starting to go through, go forward with it and, and create a methodology and start working towards it rather than just being so stiff and being like, oh, it's the unknown. There's going to be unknowns. There's going to be things you're going to mess up, but you're also going to have success. And so I think realistically, what a lot of these business leaders and things that have to understand is having the courage to understand what they already know and like, and start implementing on it. And I think there's something, there's two things on that is I really think there's a speech called from MLK called the other America, where I think people really need to watch that. And I think we'll, we'll link it in here. But the other thing too, is understanding it's impossible to suppress creativity. It's like, you can't suppress creativity. There's, there's, there's no stopping it. How many roadblocks you put in front of people or inclusion or thing of like that, people are gonna find a way to be creative, you know? Like, and it's just, it's just the way it goes. So it's like, you're trying to stop this thing that can't be stopped. And I mean, I wanna use a, a very funny example of that is like Prince with his masters, right? <laughs> so <laughs> when he couldn't get his masters back, he just changed his name, became the symbol. And then like kept on making music and stuff like that. So you can't stop creativity. Creativity is going to keep on going. It's going to keep on thriving. So that so the best thing you can do is roll the right carpet for creativity, and and let it like benefit everyone, you know. And so that's where you actually go and like opening the doors to creativity and pushing those limits and pushing them as far as you can. And and, I, and that's my kind of my final note, but. On that, I just want to thank you all for joining me. I'm really appreciative for all of you coming in just because like, like I said, you guys are all my first picks. And I was like, yes, I got all of them. So I was really happy about that. So thank you, Jason. Thank you, Karin. Thank you, Virtual, for your time and your knowledge and just creativity and beauty. Like it's just, it's really, it makes me so happy today. I'm just like, I'm really just like touched that you guys all joined this. And thanks Nick and Maria for believing in me and having me <laughs> host this thing because this is my first time moderating um, a panel. If you didn't know, now you know. <laughs> and also thanks um, Maggie and Colleen for helping being my um, favorite marketing ladies for helping put this event together. And I just, I hope some people take away from this and are inspired and learn and just invest in creativity and curiosity and just different types of people. Mm -hmm.